The reading today is from Luke 23, 33 to 43. When they came to the place called Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even snared at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Thanks so much, Laura, for, for reading that passage. I say keep that passage in front of you so you can see it. We're going to spend a little bit of time uh, in that passage because we've been sitting um, in the shadow of the cross for a lot of this morning just thinking about everything that Jesus endured in those final few moments and we're going to zoom in a little bit now and spend a little bit more time uh, thinking and reflecting uh, on those final few minutes uh, as we look to Jesus at the cross. But let me pray now and ask God for his help as we come to his word. Heavenly Father we're so thankful for the cross for the Lord Jesus Christ Father, as we reflect on everything that he endured, help us to see more clearly uh, the meaning of the cross, why it matters so much, the beauty of the cross. Father, help us uh, through this passage this morning to really see and grasp why this is not just any old Friday, but this, this is the best Friday ever. And we ask this for Jesus' glory and in his name. Amen. As I was thinking about this, I, I just started to wonder, you know, if I were to ask people what the favourite day of their week was, what would people say? I'm not saying the Sunday school answer of Sunday because we go to church, but, but genuinely, if you ask people in the street, you know, what's the favourite day of the week for you, I don't know what they'd say. And I reckon most people would say Friday, because Friday is the start of the weekend. It's the start of rest, a break, doing something different. I remember during lockdown, there was this video that went viral. Um, maybe it just went viral in my circle of friends, but it was it racked up a lot of views. It was um, this guy called Mufasa on Instagram. You might have heard of him. He's this guy who has these really colorful shirts and then uh, these shorts, and he sits in a car with his mate. His mate's taking the video, and then they turn on some music, and as soon as the music comes on, they start jamming to the beat, and then he jumps out of the car, and the car starts rolling, and he's like doing these dances. That is, it's really uplifting when you watch him. It's, it's quite fun. But in one of these songs, it starts, it's Friday, it's Saturday, Sunday, it's Friday, and it just goes, and Mufasa just, he goes for it. The dance is amazing, and it's so much fun, and this video went viral. But this one particularly went viral, why? Because I think people get it. Friday is a good day, it's the start of the weekend, it's the start of the rest that we so long for, and then Monday comes. But then we have Good Friday today. Why do we make so much of this particular Friday each year? What's so special about this day? And the reason I think is found here in this passage that we've just read. The thing is, if you actually listen to the passage again, if you read through it, this Friday doesn't sound good at all. It sounds pretty terrible. In the entire scene, there's almost nothing to say this is a Good Friday in any way. See, there are these three men being led out to be executed. And they're being led to a place called the Skull. That doesn't sound very welcoming at all, does it? Imagine if next week I decided, you know what, I'm going to go start a restaurant down in Elephant Castle. But I decided to call that restaurant the Skull. You'd be thinking, my, my, you need to have some marketing 101 here. That's not exactly the way to attract people. It's not a very welcoming, welcoming name. But then you see the people there. 
sitting around in circles, just entertaining themselves as they gamble and divide Jesus' clothes. They're stripping, stripping him of all his dignity and, and just delighting in it. And there is Jesus, naked and ashamed, straining as he tries to carry this huge cross, struggling so much that they had to grab another man called Simon to come and help him. Blood is pouring down his face from the crown of thorns in his head. His back is torn up from all the beatings. And this is becoming now like a spectator sport. There are these groups of people ringside watching. You've got different tiers of tickets. On the outer tier, verse 35, you've got these people who just stood there watching passively. And then you go in one ring into the inner tier and you've got the leaders there. Those guys are sneering at him. And then you've got the VIP seats, those who are really close, who can really touch him and bring him things. And then you've got these soldiers. And what are they doing? They're mocking him. They give him wine vinegar. That's to keep him alert so it prolongs his pain on the cross. So as we, as we sit in the shadow of the cross of Christ, it is a dark and ugly scene. So how is this in any way a good Friday? This morning, I actually want us to zoom in onto the people who are the closest to Jesus in those final minutes, who are right there. You see, in all of this darkness, there is a ray of light that shines through in this encounter of a man who is right by Jesus' side at his death. It's not one of his disciples. Remember, by this time, most of them have fled and they're watching from afar. But through this man, who's on a cross next to Jesus, we see a glimpse of why this is a good Friday. Actually, for this man, it's the best Friday ever. He points us to three simple things for us to remember and think about this morning. Here's the first. He sees God. He points us to God. See, the first thing he sees, this criminal who's crucified, with Jesus, he sees his situation. He, he hears this other criminal goading and insulting Jesus. And he looks across at him, then he looks at Jesus, and then he looks at himself. Three quite different people, but all stuck in the same situation. They're all standing before the judgment of God. See, no matter who we are, all of us will one day face death. Maybe not on a cross like this man, but we will face death. And in that moment, we will face God, the perfect judge. It cannot be avoided. And so he turns to this other criminal and he tells him, Look, pipe down, mate. Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? See, our culture today, I think we've lost sight of this. We're so, in this cancel culture, we're so careful not to pass judgment on other people. Who are you to judge, we say. And then we start imposing that on God. The God who created us, who made us, who keeps us from completely destroying this wonderful creation, who allows us to breathe, to see, to feel, to hear, this man has that big view of God in his sights. No, no, God is the perfect judge. And as he says these words that are directed towards this other criminal, I wonder if they were meant for all the others there to hear. It's definitely there for us to hear as we see them today. But for those sitting in those tears, those who are standing there just watching, indifferent, you know, maybe finding it interesting, intriguing. It's like when people slow down, when they see you know, a police car with blue flashing lights on the side of the road, just curious. Don't want to get involved, but just curious. Then there are those who, are, who despise God's plans, sneer at them, make fun of them. And we look at the cross and we look at Jesus and think, oh, that's weak. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to follow him? Or maybe even like these soldiers who actively mock and oppose God. See, this man says a warning to those people that one day you will face God. See, whether we are those following Jesus like the disciples who have since fled from Jesus as he headed to the cross, or those sitting in those tears, watching on. This morning, I'd love us to grasp this image of God once again, just as this man does. Do you not fear God because he is the perfect judge? Let's pause for a moment and reflect on this. Do you have this big view of God? How often do you think how often do we think, how often do I think of God as the perfect judge? Do we fear him rightly because, do you know what? He is the perfect judge that all of us, all of humanity will have to face one day. Let me just give us a moment to reflect on that. God as perfect judge.
As this man, he sees God, the perfect judge, he then sees perfect righteousness. That's the second thing. He sees perfect righteousness. See, as the fear of God grows and grasps his heart, as he starts to see and understand God is the perfect judge, he starts to realize what this sentence then means for him, what judgment means for him. Verse 41, he says, look, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But then he looks over to this man, Jesus. Through the bloodied and bruised face, there he sees utter perfection. Verse 41, he carries on, but this man has done nothing wrong. See, in the darkness surrounding the hill called the skull, this man sees a bright light, like a lighthouse shining across a stormy black sea. His gaze falls upon the perfection he sees in Jesus, this perfect righteousness that he sees in this man, Christ. He sees the very light of the world shining before his very eyes for him to say he has done nothing wrong. The others sitting in their tiered seats, they can't see it. The other criminal, he can't see it. But for this robber, it's so clear to him, this man has done nothing wrong. A few years ago, you might remember the story of these Chilean miners who got stuck down uh, in their mine shaft. And they were there for quite a few number of days in complete and utter darkness. And you can imagine them as the days wore on, they're covered in their filth and their sweat. But in their darkness that surrounded them, they couldn't see it until they stepped out into the light that made it so visible. They wouldn't want to stay that way, would they? See, as this man sees the beautiful, perfect righteousness of God's son hanging on a tree next to him, he sees the darkness of the world around him on this hill called the skull. And then he sees the darkness in his heart all the more clearly. Of his heart, his life, his unrighteousness. And so that's why he says in verse 41, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. See, the greater view he has of Jesus and his perfect righteousness, the deeper view he has of his own sin and his perfect unrighteousness. And the deeper view of his own sin he has, the greater view of Jesus he has, is starting to become clearer to him. And so he, as he stands before this perfect judge, he can see his dirty, tainted heart that is punished justly, he knows he's getting what he deserves. As he looks to Jesus, complete righteousness, utter perfection, the man who has done nothing wrong. See, the gulf between him and Jesus makes him realize the depth of his unrighteousness, and he has to admit it, and he does it openly. He tells the other criminal, though all those watching and listening, that we are punished justly, we're getting what our deeds deserve. And in this acknowledgement, we see this man's heart is a heart of repentance, a heart that says, I admit I've done wrong. I've sinned against God. I'm not perfect. I am unrighteous. He can only acknowledge how far he is, how far short he has fallen as he stares in wonder at the perfection of this man, Jesus. So let's take a moment to reflect. Do we have repentant hearts this morning? Where have we fallen short of God's glory, of God's word, of God's commands? Where have we not lived like Jesus does? Where have we lived in unrighteousness? See, as I was thinking about this this week, I found this really discomforting. And I realized that because, that's because I, I love to think I'm far better than I really am. I'm so good at covering things up. But when I look really deep down inside of me, and then I look at the perfection and righteousness in Jesus, it becomes clearer and clearer to me how far fall I've, how far short I've fallen. And that's what makes it really uncomfortable. That's why I don't like to talk about it. That's why I try and cover it up so hard to the watching world, to you guys. But I know, and God knows. So let's have repentant hearts as we stand before God, the perfect judge, as we see Jesus, the perfect righteousness, to acknowledge where we have fallen short. And the more we see Jesus, the more we should see how far, how far we've fallen short. And the more we see how far we fall short, we should see more clearly the beauty of Jesus, the perfect, righteous Son of God, that brings us to our knees in repentance. Let me give you a moment to, to reflect on that, and to repent when we need to. Earlier this morning, we said this prayer of confession together. 
I'm going to put those words up again on the screen if that would help you to meditate and reflect on this once again. Let's have a moment of quiet. So as this man, this robber, sees the perfect judge, as he sees perfect righteousness, as his heart is called to repentance, this is the third thing he sees. He sees the gracious king. This robber is like a moth to a flame, is drawn towards Jesus as he sees his perfection and righteousness. His gaze falls upon the crown of thorns on his head. He looks up above and sees this notice that says, this is the king of the Jews. And he asks, why is this man who's done nothing wrong under the same sentence as me and this other brother? And then he begins to smile to himself because he starts to see beyond what the world sees. Because he sees instead of this crown of thorns, he now sees the crown of glory. Instead of the king of the Jews, he sees the king of kings, king over all peoples, king over the entire universe. As his heart is opened, and admitted his sin of what he deserves. As he repents, he then sees where he needs to go. He needs to find eternal rest and protection with this perfectly righteous king. So he looks to his king and asks him one simple request, all that he knows at this point in his life. Jesus, please don't forget me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That is all I ask. This is the stark thing. The other criminal, he's crying out for life now. Jesus, save us now. Save me now. But this man, he looks beyond. He sees that he's getting what he deserves. And he looks beyond this life now. Because he sees this gracious king who is bleeding for him. Who is dying for him. And he cries out for life with Jesus into eternity. In all of this darkness surrounding this entire scene, this would become not just a good Friday, but the best Friday ever for this man. It wouldn't just be a Friday looking forward to a weekend of rest for a couple of days, but a Friday that would lead him into eternal rest and security with his perfect, merciful King. Do you know what the beauty is? These are the last words he would ever hear in his life on this earth. As Jesus looks at him through his, the blood dripping down over his brow, through his battered and bruised cheeks, you can see a small smile as he says to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. What better words could this man ever hear? You're with me. Because as this perfectly righteous Jesus dies, he would go on to take the place of the robber for all those who trust in him, like this man. His righteousness, Jesus' righteousness would become, would become theirs and their unrighteousness would become his as he takes their place on the cross. See, in all of the darkness of the scene, we see this flicker of hope in this great exchange that Jesus, the righteous one, would lay his life down for the unrighteous. And this man was the first to taste the best Friday ever. Not Peter, not John, not Paul, but this man. See, in the eyes of this world, this man would surely be died hanging on a cross in shame. But he knows that he would die smiling, knowing he is right by, he's right with his Lord, his Savior, his King. Tears of joy streaming down his face. He would die smiling, knowing that he was going to, to on that day, right at that moment, enter into paradise for eternity to live in the presence of this gracious King who laid down his life for unrighteous, broken people like him. This Friday, I want us to, to grasp that view as we sit in the shadow of the cross of what a merciful king we have in Jesus. Because this same king came to die for you, for me. As we look to Jesus on the cross, as we acknowledge and repent of our sin and come to him as the king of righteousness, he says, today you are with me. And that is why it's not just a good Friday for us but it's the best Friday ever. So would you come with me this morning 
to keep resting at the foot of the cross of Jesus in the shadow of the gracious mercy of our righteous King.